Lord, we pray right now as we reflect on your word, your revelation to us, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate these words. We pray that right now, God, for many of us, we come from many different places, many different circumstances, God, and we can miss this, God. We pray that your spirit would stir in our hearts. We pray that any distraction, we pray that any barrier that you would break that down and that we would be focused in on what you would have for us. Pray, God, that the truths of the incarnation would be felt and known today. I pray, Lord, that you would give a focus, that you would give a power to me today by your spirit. In your name we pray, amen. So we are in the middle of a series called We Believe. If you are new here or visiting, we are working our way in the season of Lent through the Nicene Creed, a creed that the church has been confessing for over 1,800 years, a confession of our faith given to us by God. Last week, we looked at the Son of God, the deity of Jesus. If that is confusing to you or you missed it, I would encourage you to hop on our website and go and watch those. And today, we're looking at this idea of this truth of the Son of Man where we confess that we as a church believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. And the question, before we get into explaining this and looking about what God's word has for us, is what what is so significant about this? For many of us, we come today thinking about Christianity as a religion And God is somebody who is far off, who is far away, up in heaven, disconnected, away from us. Or maybe he is here, but he doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand what it's like to be me. He doesn't understand these thoughts that I have in my head. He doesn't understand this temptation that I have or this struggle that I have. Or maybe God is so holy, God is so just, all these songs that we sing about his righteousness, I can't be with him because I am so undeserving. And so when we speak of God and when we sing the songs and we pray the prayers and we, we, we do all the things that we're supposed to, he just feels so far off. And we feel like, perhaps, just doesn't understand. Today as we look at this word, God has a word for you today for that exact feeling for every single creation to know that the creator understands. And the first thing that we see as we think about this tension that we may have here in John 1, this idea that God feels far off, this idea that maybe not that maybe I feel far off because of just some of the decisions I've made, some of the things that have happened in my life is the first thing, the first word that I think I I see here that we talk about in our faith and our confession is a word called condescension. Condescension. We confess, he came down from heaven. The God of the universe, the one that we looked at last week who says he, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, the one who by him all things were created, he came down to the creation. We use the word condescension. Oftentimes we use this word in a negative tone like you are speaking in condescending terms. But here we see this in a beautiful, good word where it's saying that the mighty God, the almighty God, came down from heaven. This is unlike any other faith. You see, every other faith says that there's a mountain that we must climb. And we must do these things, say these things, 
act in these ways to earn the presence of God, right? And yet the gospel says here is that we can't get up the mountain. That we can't do the things because God is so holy and God is so powerful and we have this crazy mystery that he goes down the mountain to us. He condescends to us. It says it here in verse nine. In your Bibles, if you're in John chapter one, look at what it says here in verse nine. It says this. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And the commentary is this word, true, is like this idea of like the full revelation. It's like we had a taste in the Old Testament, we got glimpses and tastes, but now for the first time this true light was coming into the world. This is a game changer. And how was the true light coming into the world? We read in Matthew 1.23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Condescension. God coming to us. Have you ever experienced this before? Perhaps you've experienced in a, a, a moment of pain, in a moment of struggle, sharing with a friend, and they, instead of just saying, sending you a nice verse, or, or they, they show up and step into your mess. We see this in condescension, but we don't just see condescension, we also see, hear this, Incarnation. We confess in the creed it was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. This is deeply significant and important to our confession. What do we mean when we say that Jesus was man? Was he God and then, and then came down and like wasn't God for a minute and then became God again? Did he come down and he was like, kind of like the demigods? Like, 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 like the spirit did something with, with Mary and, and, then, and then Jesus was born and he was kind of like a demigod? How did this work? What does our confession say? Well remember last week we've confessed he is the eternal word of God. He was never made. It says here in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We see this beautiful mystery of the incarnation, fully God, fully man. The word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. How? It tells us in Luke 1, 35, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you as he's talking to Mary at Christmas. It says, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. There is this mystery in the virgin birth of God being put in the womb of Mary. Fully God, fully man. This is the question we have as we think about what this means. What does it mean, this incarnation? I love uh, one of uh, a very helpful author for me thinking through this is a guy named J.I. Packer. He said this, the word had become flesh, a real human baby. He had not ceased to be God. He was no less God than before, but he had begun, hear this, to be man. He was not now God minus some of the elements of his deity, but God plus all that he had made, his own by taking mankind to himself. He was made man, 
He who made man was now learning what it felt like to be man. He who made the angel who became the devil was now in a state in which he could be tempted, could not indeed avoid being tempted by the devil. And the perfection of his human life was achieved only by conflict with the devil. He became man. We see this in this language in Luke. It said that there was this overshadowing that happened in Mary. This is an important part of our confession that we understand this mystery that Christ is fully God, fully man. It's not minus. And he dwelt among us. I love what Eugene Peterson in the message says. He says, he moved into the neighborhood. You guys ever had like new neighbors moving into the neighborhood and you're kind of like looking over the fence, like wondering what's going on? He moved into your neighborhood. And what did the neighborhood look like? It was a manger. The Son of God, the Almighty God, where did he choose to move into? In humility. which is the third piece of this, as we think about what it means for him to be the son of man, we have condescension, we have incarnation, literally becoming man, and then hear this, humiliation. This is the profound, unreasonable beauty of the gospel. It says, and he became truly human. He became truly human. Now, if you're like me, an engineer, you're wondering, how, did, how does this work? How did, how did Christ become truly human? It says in verse 10, it says, he was in the world. And the world was made through him, an allusion to the earlier verses where it said that God, Christ himself, the Son of God, was a part of the creating process, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is the humiliation piece. What do we mean when we say humiliation? Philippians 2 really helps us with that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians 2. It says this. It's a, it's, a, it, it's a word from Paul to us and how we should treat each other based upon the incarnation. It says this, in your relationship with one another, the ways that you treat one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, saying he's God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Have you thought about the profound significance that when Christ came to earth in the incarnation, he came to die. This is what the confession of Lent is. We live because of his death. He died to live so that we could live to die to ourselves. And in the humiliation of Christ, we see that there was this, in Philippians, it tells us there was this giving up. There's a lot of debate in theology and doctrine about what does this mean? There was this, last week we talked about the Arians who believed that, that Christ was begotten, that he was made, and we talked about that controversy and that heresy. This time, there was this other, other piece. The Gnostics would say that, that it's bad to be flesh. So when Christ came, he wasn't actually really man. He was like two persons. But we recognize in our confession that he's fully God, fully man. One of my um, theology books, the big th thick books, I read it about once a year when I preach sermons like this. Erickson says this, he says, 
Jesus gave up the independent exercise of his divine attributes. This does not mean that he surrendered some or all of his divine attributes, but that he voluntarily gave up the ability to exercise them, hear this though, on his own. He could exercise them only in dependence on the Father and in connection with possession of a fully human nature. We see in the Gospels time and time again, if you read through the Gospels, Christ's dependence on the Father Time and time again, we see the eternally begotten Son of the Father trusting in the Father. We see this most significantly in the Garden of Eden, I mean in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's praying to the Father, he's anxious, he's literally sweating drops of blood because he knows that the cross is coming, and what does Christ say? He says, Father... If it's your will, remove this cup. The cup was the very wrath of God, the very, the very, all that we deserve. He said, if it's your will, remove this from me. I don't know if I can do this, but not my will, your will be done. We see time and time again these moments when leaning into the Father, trusting into the Father, Christ would, would, would have miracles, acts of, of, of miraculous healing, acts of, of knowing things about people, about their hearts that only God would know. And then we see moments in the Gospels where it seemed to be that Christ didn't know some things because he was trusting in the Father. It's kind of like it's all this metaphor I thought helpful when we think about what it meant for Jesus to give up, to become fully human, to, to, to the humiliation of that. Kind of like at a bank if you have a, drop, uh, like a lock box and there's two people with a key and you both need that key to access. This is kind of what we're talking about when we think through his dependence upon the Father and his total embracing of being human. And maybe at this point you're asking, why does this matter? Why can't we just continue just to say that we believe in Jesus? Why, why does it matter that he was fully man? Why does it matter that he was fully God? Because it's the gospel. Because it changes everything because this is the only way, because Christ himself said, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the only way for you to get to him. I gotta come to you, you can't come to him. I need a perfect human to die my horrible death so that I can live. In our confession, in our creeds, we declare this. You may miss this, but before we even say that he came down from heaven, what do we say? We say, for us and our salvation. This is, you ask, why did Christ come? Turn to the person next to you and tell them he came for me. I know you can't believe that. Especially looking at the person next to you, he came for that person. <laughs> I think sometimes we've been in church a while, we just miss this. He came for you. He came for us, for us. And he didn't just come to like be our best friend. He didn't just come to, to be a self-help book. He didn't just come to comfort us. He didn't just come to give us good advice for how to be successful in life. For us and what? Our salvation. He came down from heaven. As you ask yourself why this matters, my first point is straight from the text. As you think about what this means for you, maybe today you feel far off from God. Maybe you feel he is so far away, I, or I am so far from him. 
The incarnation tells us this, says this, and it's telling you, receive Jesus. Receive Jesus, receive. Turn to the person next to you and say, receive. That's pretty weak. Turn to the, person, the other person next to you and say, receive. <laughs> Look at what it says here. Don't miss this in John. Look at what it says here. Look at what John is saying here. Look at verse 12. We see the humiliation that says his own people would not know him. But it says, but to all, what did Steve say, the whoever's? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. When we say his name, we're talking about what, who he is, his person and his work. Who believed Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. It's all who believed in his name, what does he do? He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I think somebody today here needs to hear this. Christ is calling you to receive him. Not to earn him. Not to, not, not, to, not to maybe, you know what, maybe I'll just start going to church for like six months and then, then I've done enough work where then I can start like maybe officially being a Christian. <laughs> maybe I can start reading my Bibles or, or maybe today will be the day that I stop doing that sin. Maybe today will be the day that I stop having this anger in me. I stop looking at that porn. I, start, I stop doing these things. And, and if I could get the handle on that, then I'll follow Jesus. The gospel says, receive him. He is the higher power that can change you. Second, relate to Jesus. This is such a significant part of the incarnation. I love, uh, Dane Ortland wrote a book called Gentle and Lowly. In his book, he says, Jesus is not Zeus. He was a sinless man, not a sinless Superman. He came as a normal man to normal men and women. He knows what it is, hear this, to be thirsty, to be hungry, to be despised and rejected, scorned, shamed, embarrassed, abandoned, misunderstood, falsely accused, suffocated, tortured, and killed. He knows whatever it is in your head, you say, I'm so far off from God. No, he's, he's there, he's been there. The book of Hebrews helps us with this. If you struggle with this, I would encourage you to spend some time in Hebrews chapter two and Hebrews chapter four. I'm gonna focus on chapter four. It says this, since we have a great high priest. This is an illusion if you're understanding what that was. The priests in the Old Testament were the ones that were mediating between us and God, the ones that were making the sacrifices, the ones that were helping us to be right with God. Since we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, capital S. What does it say? Let us hold fast our confession. We believe in one God, who for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Let us hold fast to our confession. Why? For we do not have a priest who is unable to sympathize in our weakness. Look at, don't miss this. It doesn't say we don't have a priest who's unable to sympathize us when we got things figured out. It says who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness. Christ took on flesh, and when you're in those struggles, he 
took on those struggles, but unlike every other human being in the history of humanity, Christ did not fall. For some of those temptations that we may have, some of those struggles we may have, think about this, Christ probably dealt with that at a level that you could never understand. C.S. Lewis talks about this in a way, have you ever, uh, when you're standing up against the wind, a really strong wind, eventually the tendency is to just drop, to fall. And the wind gets stronger and the wind gets stronger. Christ never failed. He took on it all. Last week we talked about this. We talked about when you can't, remember that he can. When you don't, remember that he did. As I was thinking about this and thinking about our church and thinking about all your beautiful faces, I felt like I just needed you to know Christ understands. And he is with you. Doing something. And so as you, as we think about the significance of the incarnation, we receive him and we relate to him. He's not far off. As we sang today, we surrender it to him. And finally, revel in Jesus. Revel is kind of a word we don't use very often. I liked it because it started with the word with the letter R, and I wanted everything to start with R, let's be honest. <laughs> but it also relates to this idea of awe and wonder. It relates to this idea that in the incarnation there's this incredible mystery that I, it's unreasonable and I really can't explain it, and the gospel is so beautiful and it's true and it's for me. I think every single week here at church, we're trying to do this. We're trying to revel in the wonder of Christ, in the wonder that we are a people saved by grace for our good and his glory. This is what John in, in his, in uh, first John writes, he says this, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. Receive him. Relate to him. Revel in his wonder. It's this incredible invitation that we have as Christians to be in the very presence of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18, one of my favorite gospel verses says this, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We can be a people that revel in the glory of Christ, in the glory of what he's done. I believe he will continue by his word through the fellowship that we're in, do something in us. This is the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of incarnation. And as you think about this, as you wonder, maybe feeling far off from God, I would encourage you to think through the implications of this for you. J.I. Packer says this, he says, 
Perhaps it has never been formulated better than in the words of the Athanasian Creed. That's another creed that we'll probably study in the future. It says, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, perfect God and perfect man, who although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ, one not by con conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking on the manhood into God. Hear this, our minds cannot get beyond this. What we see in the manger is, in Charles Wesley's words, our God contracted spawn, incomprehensibly made man, incomprehensibly. We shall be wise to remember this, to shun speculation and countedly to adore it. Contentedly to adore, thank you, Laura. My walking spell check. Reminded of the Christmas song, oh come let us adore him. And I would encourage you, church, as you think through this, I don't know where you are on this Lord's Day. Perhaps this is the first time you've been in a church building in a while. Perhaps you've been faithfully following the Lord for quite some time. Or anything in between. I would remind you of the gospel that Steve declared at the beginning. We are a people, a bunch of whoever's who declare and confess a faith in a God who became man, lived a perfect life, dwelt among us, died for us so that we could live. As you reflect on this, we're gonna sing about how this is the better word, about how this is the best word, and I would just encourage you, with your church family here, to spend some time reveling in Christ to spend some time thinking through the implications and the significance of what it means that God has come to us, that he's moved into the neighborhood, that he has showed up and saved you. Receive him. Relate to him. Revel in him. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so thankful for your gospel. We are so thankful, God, that even though we may feel far off, even though we may feel that we have no right to enter into your holy presence, we confess that, we repent of sin, and we recognize, Jesus, that you are the high priest, that you have made a way. And so we live in a place of confession and repentance and leaning into you, King Jesus, ruling in our hearts, and we revel in that. I pray, Lord, today. Perhaps there's somebody watching or here in this room that is feeling you calling. I pray, Lord, that they, in this moment, would receive you that they would just pray with me this simple prayer. Jesus, I receive you. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of grace. I can't make it up the mountain. You have come to me. I believe in you as my savior. And I give my life to you and invite you to reign and rule in my heart. You are my Lord. Or perhaps today, you're just being reminded of the gospel. You're being reminded of the call to live in a way that is contra contrary to this world and even to your flesh. And I would just invite you to continue to pray this with me. Jesus, you are my king. I pray by your spirit that you would continue to strengthen and guide and comfort me. I pray that you would hold me fast and continue to do your work in me. And so Lord, we give our lives to you, we give our hearts to you, we pray that you, in this time of your gathered church of the beloved singing to you, that this would be a sound that is pleasing 
to your ears, not necessarily just because they're words that are nice, but because you see our hearts. And because you see hearts that have received you, you see hearts that have related to you, you see hearts that are reveling in you. So may it be a pleasing sound to your ears. We love you. In your name we pray.